welcome to the Next Canon Podcast. My name is Danny Ray, you know that, and on this podcast we are working to recreate and reimagine the theater canon to make it more like how we want it to be. Hey you guys, I'm so excited. Today we have Chessa Betancourt. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, how's, how's it going, Chessa? It's going pretty well. Amazing. Um, I just came from a very frustrating DMV appointment, but then I mm. bought myself a bunch of plants to pros and cons. Kind of comfort myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pros and cons. Amazing. Chessa uses she, her pronouns. Chessa lives on the East Coast right now in DC, and she is an intimacy director, actor, theater maker extraordinaire. <laughs> so tell the people a little bit more about yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I don't know that I would use the term extraordinaire. I don't know if I'm that fancy, but yeah, I do. I perform. I do. My like heart background is in like devised, like weird theater work. Um, I'm also like an educator and facilitator. I do a lot of like professional development for artists and educators around theater and the arts and theater education. Um, I, when I was living in Seattle, I ran a storytelling event called She is Fierce, stories from the female and gender queer perspective. Mm-hmm. And we're now sort of in the pandemic transitioning into a podcast um, mm-hmm. because we're now split by a whole country, me and my co-producer. Um, mm-hmm. And also things are not all the way live happening these days. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think those are all the things. That's pretty cool. I feel like I've heard of that, like in the adjacent in my time at Cornish College of the Arts, I feel like. When were you in Seattle again? Um, We moved uh, in like basically right before the pandemic in August of 2019. Yeah, we've had some, many a Cornish baby in She is Fierce. We love it. We love it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So in this concept of canon, what does that mean to you? What is canon as a word, as a concept mean to you? Yeah, I was trying to think of the answer to this question and um, I cheated a little bit because I was like, what is the definition of canon? So I looked it up and there isn't really one, like a technical definition for what we mean when we say canon, um, which I thought was weird, but I feel like it's any, I feel like it, it's sort of cross-referenced with the term mainstream of Mm -hmm. like, this is on theme, this is popular this is something that everyone knows or this is like like in a certain lane and normally Mm -hmm. that lane is like what everyone has agreed upon is the popular thing is the mainstream thing is the thing that everyone should know and produce and be in the audience of yeah I think like but I struggled to think about what that meant to me yeah this is what's real exactly like here's what's real theater, television, film, music, and here's what's like not canon, which is a like diversion from that. Yeah, like f- fringe, one might say, in some, in some realms, I guess, or like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the closest synonym I could think of was mainstream, was yeah. like, here's what's mainstream for this art form, and here's what's fringe, here's what's alternative. Yeah. Definitely. That's, that's yeah. super true. And it's, it is so weird. It's like, there's no real definition except for in our mainstream understanding of it. You know what I mean? Like it lives in there as like, this is a part of that canon for this thing, like Shakespeare or Harry Potter or Marvel, <laughs> like all these things. Totally. Like there's, there's like canon versus, um, I like to think about it sometimes as like canon versus like fan fiction. If I think about it that way, it makes sense a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> that comparison. <laughs> Definitely. Um so in our what what shows really just scream like this is canon to you. This is theater canon. This is what people mean when they say that. Oh boy. I mean, I think Shakespeare is the one that comes to mind. Um I think musical I think if if people are thinking from an external place of not being a theater person I think people think musicals like I think people think Broadway mm-hmm. I think people think like Chicago 42nd Street like I think that's what <laughs> what my friends and I like lovingly refer to as normies think that theater is and don't really consider like that there's such a breadth of things um that theater can be and that theater is and so I think like yeah, Broadway, 
like musicals, mainstream musicals, Shakespeare. And I feel like for, for most, uh, for most theater people, things like Tennessee Williams, things like Chekhov, things like, you know, Neil Simon or yeah, like those sort of like Mm -hmm. classics. I'm putting classics in air quotes Mm because that's (laughs) how I feel. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But I feel like, uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of old white people for sure. Yeah. Is what I think we consider, we consider canon. It is interesting that you bring up that normies think of musicals and then they really don't think of straight plays. Like I, I, like even from remembering being like normie adjacent before you like learn things, you know, I don't know that I ever was like, oh yes, this specific play, like the importance of being earnest or something like that. I never really thought about them in the same way like this is theater. No, me neither. And I think like, I think maybe the closest people come to is stuff like doubt that I think people outside of like the theater profession or the theater world, you know, like when, if you're like name a play, they would probably have to divert to Shakespeare, I feel like, or have yeah. to like fall back on Shakespeare. Cause it was in our, in like English classes or whatever. Right. Cause you have some sort of other exposure to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I really personally am very interested in what it looks like to sort of remove the barriers to, to people that don't have exposure to theater to, being engaged with theater Mm because I think a lot of people hear the word and think it's not for them for a lot of different reasons um when really I see it as something that is one of the most accessible pieces of of art or media Mm -hmm. or types of art or media but I don't think people ever think it's for them because they're like oh I don't like musicals or oh I don't like Shakespeare (laughs) but there's so much other other stuff that they could be engaging with they just don't know how to get to it or it costs money or they don't know about it right or it's like they they think they're a human type like if they're an athlete they don't think or if they're like a they don't think they can do they can go to those shows not just they don't think that's not what I was saying (laughs) no totally I don't think they can go see it or like if they're xyz too young too old all these things yeah well I think about I always think about like how theater people are represented in like television shows like I think of friends and the way Mm -hmm. that Joey like whenever he was in like a play, he was wearing like a black turtleneck. It was like pretty weird. And I was just like, is this what people think is always what theater people are doing? I mean, sometimes we're being really weird, but I think, yeah, that the way the way people think theater is, is like it's either Broadway or it's like performance art that's so abstract and sort of like self-indulgent that it's completely unwatchable. And I'm like, th- those are just very specific very different (laughs) things that are not really what theater is in my opinion (laughs) or they don't all encompass what theater is you know what I mean right like there those things exist but it's not like that's the whole deal when you think of theater yeah like I remember taking a performance art class and then then my brain was like everything is basically performance art because we're all like sort of performing at some level almost all the time or something and like that's so funny but you're right I was just like it's crazy that they would change Joey's uh <laughs> literal costuming per episode based on if he was the the bro guy that day or the actor and he played both of those facets of Joey <laughs> and it's like bro people could be actors yeah <laughs> which is I guess maybe what they were maybe that's what they were trying to say that bro people can be actors but then they would put him in a yeah. turtleneck <laughs> And very specifically cast it or costume him in that episode. That's really funny. I didn't think about that, but I was watching Friends last night. (laughs) And it was one of the episodes where he was performing in a play. The one where there's like a, I don't know if you remember this, but there's like a spaceship and he's like, I'm going to get on this spaceship and I'm going to go to the planet, blah, 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 and do something or whatever. And I was just, well, like also there are plays that totally exist that don't make any sense or are ridiculous for sure. But yeah. like th- that is like the one time they're like, there's going to be a play in this episode. They're like, it's going to be a living room drama where there's also a spaceship. And you're yeah. like, there are so many ways you could <laughs> choose like, to represent like the theater world. And this it, had to be a bad, it had to be a bad, horrible play that got horrible reviews. And that was a plot point. Like it had to do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like plays are ever represented well or like 
positively even in things that are like tv or or movies necessarily that might be true well because maybe it's because they think it's too hard to like make it seem like a really good play because then you have to think about how good that play is and try to make that good play so they're like I can't make a good play so let's pretend it's a bad play because I can make a bad play it's like trying to write a song that's going to be like played in a movie. You're like, oh, well, yeah. if the song is good, then we actually have to think about the song being good. And we have to hire a songwriter that knows how to write song. Like, rather than just if it's bad, we can just sort of make it up. And that can be a plot point, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We don't have to like hire a playwright to make this scene that's really well made. Right. And that maybe that seems like it tracks to me. Like that, that could be why they do that. I have no idea. But that seems like yeah. a good reason. Um, so in in this canon of what what we all know off the top of our head and all that stuff, what's your show that's got to go? There's so many of these. Um, the one that came to mind was Our Town. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> like it's a just the whitest possible play in the whole world. And it's also just like so boring. And I just, I even remember it being sort of dated in terms of the way that people of different genders interact or like what romance is. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I also wrote down Tennessee Williams because I was trying to think of a play that I like still think is necessary to be producing. And we just did a lot of it in college and there, you know, there sexual assault and mental illness are plot points in a lot of Tennessee Williams that I don't think they need to be there's also a lot of like sort of toxic like this is what love is or this Mm -hmm. is what romance is and as I continue intimacy directing and sort of like exploring what intimacy is and how we should represent it I'm like I really have my eye on things that I'm like this is perpetuating something that we don't necessarily need to perpetuate anymore yeah, and I think those those plays can be historical documents that we honor as part of the like history of of theater, but whether or not they need to be done now is like I just can't come up with a reason why they need to be done now. Yeah. And the like it's the why this play and why now, which is what my playwriting teacher always had us ask when we were reading plays. It's like why this play and why right now? So if there's not a reason, what are you doing? What's what's going on? You're not going to make a statement on something. <laughs> yeah. And I I didn't see the production of Oklahoma that recently was on Broadway that was super, super different, that was pretty dark. I don't know if you heard about this production of Oklahoma. I didn't. Uh, the, they did a, re- a like revival, essentially, that was very dark and very interestingly, it was like basically gave weight to all of the things that are sort of like offhandedly said or done Mm -hmm. in the original play and I heard it was amazing but before Mm -hmm. that point I was like we don't need ever need to do Oklahoma again like we don't ever need to do that play again and I think and I had many people tell me I didn't get to see it we were planning on seeing it and then the pandemic happened or it closed I can't remember which thing happened yeah um yeah I think I heard from a lot of people that um that production would have changed my mind about whether or not we need to do Oklahoma but I feel like a lot of that era of like what we consider air quotes classics yeah like those can be historical documents but do we need them to to be on our stages now I don't think they do yeah it's like if you're gonna say something new and fresh about it that can be what we can talk about you know instead of like come see guys and dolls (laughs) <laughs> we're gonna do it one. normally <laughs> <laughs> right we're just gonna like yeah it's that's and it's sort of why I don't feel that way about Shakespeare is because I think there are there's so much in Shakespeare that you can sort of take and reinterpret and reframe and mm-hmm. set differently which people do I mean I definitely think when you do Shakespeare you have to consider okay but like why why do we still connect so much to this but I don't feel that same way about Shakespeare because I do feel like it has a lot of malleability. I don't know if that's a word, but no, it is malleable. Yeah. Yeah. Malleability, I think is a word. Um, Great. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I think you got it. Uh, Definitely. Cause like, especially within the poetic language, there's ways to like use that and uh, like just tell different stories. Like I could spew off a whole bunch that people have worked on, but I've done that in lots of episodes. So um, 
go watch Ana Maria's episode, audience members, and or um, oh, yeah. Rosa Garcia's Ana Maria episode. Campoy? Yeah. What a gem. A gem, a serious gem. We love, we love her. And uh, Meme Rosa Garcia had a really cool like audio drama podcast about Hamlet, but also it was based on uh, their life. So mm-hmm. House of Sueños, right? Yes, House of Sueños. Yeah. It was fantastic. I don't know if you listened to it while it was live, but it, it was amazing. So keep your eye out for more of that, friends listening. It's also funny because like in my Instagram, I remember saying uh, like Shakespeare plays done in period as like a thing we don't want to do. Like let's totally. not do them in unless you're gonna put something on that. You know what I mean? Like if you're just gonna do straight up Shakespeare in period. I question. Yeah. I also, at this point, I'm like, those plays have been done so much that someone has done it better than you in period. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like Folger or, um, which is the, the Shakespeare theater here that has the first folio or like, you know, the Shakespeare theater in New York and in the park, like, I think, you know, the public theater, like they have all done Shakespeare way better than we ever can. <laughs> in its like true form and I know people who are sort of purists in terms of Shakespeare that like it has to be done in time period oh my God, and yeah. accurately and that the language has to be used very specifically and I I'm like I get why you would want to like preserve it or practice it but to fully produce it I'm like well, why that we've all seen it also there's enough filmed versions that people have access to a lot of really good like true to time period Shakespeare and so yeah. what are why are yeah it feels repetitive to me in a way that doesn't feel useful yeah definitely my one of my favorite recently they kept the language pretty pretty uh true but they did an all-female cast at the rep with Sarah Harlett of uh um Richard the third oh yeah which was pretty epic and yeah the amazing thing about uh, about it was that Sarah was so good with the language that I understood everything. And like, that is a very tough part of Shakespeare to like yeah. get it. <laughs> and again, with people who don't think that theater is for them, I think um, I did actually here, I lived in DC many years ago um, and I did um, The Tempest in an all-female cast that's with this really amazing um, like punk theater company called Taffety Punk. Mm-hmm. Um, and every year they do an all-female Shakespeare cast that they call the Riot Girl series. Um, and so I was in that, in The Tempest. And at the same time, the like really big Shakespeare theater here was doing The Tempest. Like, you know, that sort of accident yeah. happens every once in a while. Yeah. And my sister had been like, I, I'm totally going to come see you, but I just like, don't understand Shakespeare. Like, I don't understand the language. I don't get what's going on. And we went to go see the big version, the STC version. And, uh, she was like, yep, nope. I have no idea what anybody is saying. And then she came to see ours, which was like a very sort of bare bones, sort of black box, very lot, like a lot of attention to like character and relationships over yeah. anything else. Yeah. Partially because of the budget, but partially that's because how Taffy Punk sort of functions. And she was like, I understood everything. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. Like that's how it's <laughs> meant to be. It's not actually meant to be a very, it was originally like for the people when it was made. And when you do it really well, or when you do it with understanding in mind rather than like fanciness in mind. Mm hmm it's way more accessible. And she was like, I didn't realize that that was the difference is that sometimes people are reciting and not feeling or communicating. Or even understanding themselves. (laughs) Oh yeah. I've definitely done some shit where I've been like, I'm just saying. (laughs) What am I saying? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) These are just sounds that are coming out of my mouth. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're very pretty. I don't know what I'm saying. You don't know what I'm saying, but I sound (laughs) nice when I say them. Yeah, they flow. There's a flow there. Something's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So um, in growing from that and like hoping for things that are actually, you know, saying something and like saying something in the moment, like what is your show that everyone should know and that should be in the canon today? I think I'm going to cheat on this question a little bit. <laughs> um, 
I just generally think like new plays by new playwrights. I think there's so many people doing such interesting things with form and also moving away from like the living room drama and into like, how can we make this magical or how can we play with the form of what this the script is um there's two two young playwrights both of whom I know but who are like up and coming one is Samantha Cooper um Samantha is a good friend of mine but she she just like plays a lot with sort of like what reality is in her plays and just does not limit to her herself to what is realistic but also her characters are very real um and another one is Andrew Andrew Rincon um who's a, a Latinx playwright who is like I just love his work so much because it's a lot of magical realism and the characters are very real, but it's a lot of, I was in a reading of his um, called, I want to fuck like Romeo and Juliet. So sorry for swearing in the title. Um, you can bleep it and then put in, in the like poster or in the name, he does like the little symbols. The little asterisks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that he can like put it on different places, but it was just, it was like such a beautiful play about love and relationships and like it was mostly people of color and mostly latinx people and i was like so happy to be in it but it was also not about you know trauma or like it wasn't about like the struggle of the, it was like this magical really fun play that you could also like design in so many different ways mm -hmm. and i think yeah, both of those playwrights. But I think there's a lot of people doing that right now is also like producing work, especially with with people of color or global majority folks like centered or folks with disabilities centered or queer people centered that like think beyond like, okay, the literal stories, you know, either historically or about like the struggles of marginalization that are just like, no, let's just like make a play about witches that is... <laughs> you know, has this cast. And I think, yeah, stuff that plays with, with what a play is and recent plays, I think there's so much to choose from at this point. Like there's mm -hmm. so many new playwrights. There's so much being put out into the world that's really, really good. And I think it's just hard to do the homework. But I think once people do the, that homework, they'll discover so many great things that they won't want to go back to things like our town. Like there right. was just not going to be a desire. I just think that, yeah. Why, why do our town when you can do, I want to fuck like Romeo and Juliet. Like, <laughs> you know, like exactly. I just like, I can't imagine picking our town in that. Yeah. In that split. Um, yeah. So I think <laughs> things that, that play with what a play is and things that are written recently by, um, not old white men. Yes. Please, God, old white men, just stop for a minute. <laughs> yeah, like, just, we, we don't need you to go away, but, like, just maybe just sh for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> just maybe just, just keep it right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep it in. <laughs> you don't need that. Um, that's why I always say, like, I'm not burning these books, everyone. No one can get mad at me for this. We're just talking about <laughs> plays people can leave on the shelf if they're trying to plan their season. You don't need it. Yeah. If you need to look at it for like, oh, I remember this scene from something. Let me read it. Sure. Go read that scene. Yeah. But do other shows. Yeah. Like that, that one sounds like fun. Uh, that I, I wonder, I wonder, so I want to see that play just because of how you, how you said the title. That is very much a title that makes me like, oh, I'm going to the theater immediately. I must yeah. see that show. Yeah, and it's a it's like a beautiful show. It's sad. It's funny, and it's magical. I think I've really realized that my like sweet spot is like things that are not abstract, but that are like sort of magical or like beyond reality, but where the characters and relationships are very real. Yeah, I think like that. I really felt is like the things that I want to both see and the things I want to be part of are sort of live in that realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Which is, yeah, a recent thing, not a recent thing, but I think a, a more recent thing that we're sort of playing with as a, as an industry. Yeah. And I think the addition of social media into the world, uh, helps us see more of that stuff as like an option, maybe like, there's a lot of reasons I don't enjoy being on or doing the social media element of shows, but, um, 
or just life. No, thank you. <laughs> Art, but it does make it so yeah. it's easier to find newer stuff or like cool things happening. I would guess maybe question mark. Yeah. Yeah. It helps us broaden our horizons a little bit, I think. Yeah. But I feel you on social media. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a struggle. No, thank you. <laughs> I find for artists, a lot of times it's like, do I want to be doing this or am I just making this for other people at this point? <laughs> yeah. And like the need, to, the like sort of shift from art to content, I think. Mm-hmm. It, content creator. The content yeah. Which I think also creator. there, I've seen stuff on <laughs> Instagram reels, which is like not TikTok, but also is TikTok. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't have a TikTok, but I do sometimes <laughs> partake in the reels. Yes. <laughs> um, but I'm like, there's some beautiful short filmmaking in that, in some of that. I feel like I see some like really beautiful, interesting things on social media, but it, but it's like conflated with with stuff that I can feel like is forced content creation or like Mm -hmm. really feeling the pressure to stay relevant or to stay something that people click on or like or or to feed the audience or whatever I know this guy that uh there's this comedian musician he's a musician comedy dude from uh he lives in Sydney Australia and he made these hilarious little songs like when I when I discovered him he had like three or four like really funny little like fully produced like edited like comedy songs that I really identified with and then he like blew up aggressively into like this he like so many people are like give us more songs give us more songs give us more songs and they're still funny but they just are like a different Like it sort of shifted when he had to create it because people wanted it instead of like, these are funny. I'm going to make them since we're all in a pandemic. So I'm trapped in my music basement anyways or whatever. But like they were so funny. And now I'm like, every time I'm like, I want to support you because I know you're, you're good at what you're doing. But I feel like some of it is a little bit pushed. Please. I mean, he will literally never see this, but like. Don't yell at me, Tom Cardi, for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't yell at me. It just looks a little like, unfortunately, pushed out of the like cool, fun vibe that it was before. I don't know. Yeah. I, well, I think like when we make art, we're not really like, no one, it, the original like spark to make something very rarely comes from someone being like, can you make me something? Like, that's right. just not how artistic brains work and so I think some people can deliver in that way Mm -hmm. I'm not really a person who can like if I'm like commissioned to make something um yeah and I think that's something that more visual artists kind of struggle with because they're commissioned to do a lot of things yeah but I don't know I think everybody yeah like the the push to my partner is a comedian is a does a lot of sketch and his like heart is in like live sketch comedy um but he's been like comedy wise like i'm feeling the the like pressure to be making a bunch of digital content like i'm, yeah. I'm feeling the pressure to be like putting out little videos and stuff because that's how people are basically like getting discovered in this sort of writing and performing comedy realm mm-hmm. but like that's not really what so he's ha- he's been like teaching himself film editing and editing and stuff but I think it's it's hard to think of it that way. It's like, oh, yeah. I guess I need to be like making on this level, even though that's not necessarily what I would be making if I were left to my own devices, if I were just being an artist. Right. right. It it's like a crisis of a uh, crisis of necessity almost, because it's like we have to be doing something, or the or the masses will be like, where are you? Or you you will perceive that the masses are like, nope, I don't see you. Nope. Goodbye. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, being a, an internet personality, I think is like real work. And in some ways you don't have the same boundaries that people who are not like public figures in that way do. Yeah. Like there's people really feel like they, they need to have access to you, I think in a, in a complicated way. And then you're, you're sort of constantly at their beck and call. Yeah. 
I, I wonder how many of those people have actually like actually feel like positively about sharing that because some people totally seem like they do. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And it is really nice to get to know the people when you're feeling like very isolated or whatever. Like it, it gives the dopamine to the people watching, which is why they're like, give me more of that. Give me more. Yeah. There are podcasts <laughs> where I'm like, I love feeling like I'm hanging out with these people yes. <laughs> and like, I want more episodes so I can like play them when I'm feeling isolated or alone. Exactly. So I don't want them to like force themselves into something that they're not, <laughs> they don't have capacity for. Exactly. I, um, when I was in high school, I was a huge fan of, uh, Miranda Sings. Do you know what, do you know who that is? Yes. Yeah. So Miranda Sings, Colleen Ballinger, a uh, huge fan, still like adore following her life. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, she decided to uh, vlog every day for a month. And then it was vlog every day for quarantine. And then quarantine extended over a year. So she vlogged every day for a year. And wow. now she still, still does most weekdays because it's like really relax. It like is nice for her. She's like, it feels like a diary to like get everything out and you guys are interested. And like, sometimes you guys help me with things, even though sometimes I see a lot of hate and like all of these things, it's like, she's mm -hmm. very hot and cold about it. But like, it is one of those things you get used to where you're like, oh, this person's kind of a part of my life because I watched their video. And then it's like, you're kind of a part of their life because you watch their video, but they don't see how it affects you directly. Yeah. So weird. And you can be like, I have literally listened to your voice for <laughs> hours upon hours. And so I sort of know your personality in a way that you do not know mine and will not ever know mine, which is a very strange relationship to have. Yeah, entirely, entirely. It's so, it's so odd and surreal, but, um, yeah, we went on a tangent. I love that little tangent. Where did we, how did yeah. we get there? <laughs> we were, we started talking about uh, shows to do and we were talking about oh, like, how magical like social realism. Media affects it. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> I love when that happens. I'm like, where am I? What time is it? <laughs> yeah. Where did we go? Um, where did we go? Um, so, yeah, magical realism. Is there any more aside from I want to? like Romeo and Juliet that you're like this everyone go go see at least this one <laughs> I mean I think yeah Andrew Rincon's work Samantha Cooper's work um I really like a lot of Lauren Gunderson's work I feel like I'm mostly saying playwrights just because I like I feel like once I find a, a new person sort of like following people on social media where yeah. like once I find a new like podcast or person who I'm like oh I really like this person's perspective I'm like oh all of this person's work um <laughs> Yeah, so I feel I feel generally like I just like to see more new things. Yeah. So I don't have specific plays that I'm like, everyone has to do this. Um, I just want to see more new things and more different types of people both making and being in them. And Definitely. how that happens, I think, is is like up to whatever community you're in or audience you're serving or group of artists you're working with. But I think we're just we tend to like veer away from new things because we think that people won't come. But I think that's mm. a, that's an outreach problem. You know, yeah. that's not a problem with the content. That's like, then we need to be removing the, the barriers to the normies, right? We need yeah. to, for them to not just feel like they can come if it's Greece, right? Because they're right. like, oh, I know that. <laughs> we need to be being like, yeah, but what, like what would interest you? Or like, I promise this thing will be like fun and exciting for you to be in. Mm -hmm. How do we communicate that? rather than falling back on just like recognizable titles. Yeah, definitely. That's a good point. I also was thinking about like, it's kind of like reading books where it's like, I I hadn't read like a new book in a long time. And so like, I listen to the audio books sometimes that are new, which is always really fun, but it's usually like every six months. But recently it's been getting, it's been picking up in speed. Mm -hmm. um, and like all of, all of 2020, I don't think I read a single book. I think I was a little like, struggle busing in my mind <laughs> but then yeah. in like the beginning Amen. of <laughs> yeah in the beginning of 2021 I think I read like 10 books within like the first three months because I was like I need to reread all my favorites and I need to do this and that and blah 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 and it was I started reading a couple of new ones which was really cool but then it's like then that awakens the um I'm circling back I promise um <laughs> that awakens the like desire to go see something new like see a new movie, see a new play, see something you don't yeah. know the answer to. Only walk into something knowing, well, these two people 
um, are in this dire situation and chaos ensues, you know, or only walk into it. <laughs> Will Rebecca fall in love with Dan? You know, like only knowing those things <laughs> and trusting that something will happen. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. I'm exactly the same way. I will rewatch Parks and Recreation a thousand times before I'll try a new show. But sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I like clicked on that random. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's like the paradox of choice. It's like when we have so much stuff to see and and read. I have a hard, I have a hard time reading new books too, but it's mostly because I like there's so many that I'm like, how do I just pick a book to start right. reading? And I think, yeah, kind of in the same realm as something performative that you're going to go see you're like if I don't know a lot about it it's hard for me to just sort of choose to go see a piece of theater that I don't know a lot about and so yeah. how do we like give people enough information to do that but also I feel like how do we all just get better at trying new things and deciding to take risks yeah. with the types of experiences we have <laughs> and I don't know the answer because I'm still re-watching Parks and Rec for the zillionth time and it's scary to walk into a show with especially if you're alone especially if you don't know any of the actors you know what I mean? And that can't be our entire audience. It's just people that know us in groups of friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. We need the people we don't know to also come see the shows. Yeah. And as I get older, I'm just like, I don't have time for shit to be bad. Like, I don't have time to sit through something and then hate it. Right. So I'm going to go to something I like or to, you know, go see someone that I know is a good performer where I'm right. like, at least I know that that person is going to carry things <laughs> in a way that they like, in a way that I'm going to like. Yeah. But I'm also like, I'm not going to like put on real pants and then go pay for a <laughs> ticket for something I don't know if it's going to be good or not, which is maybe not a good outlook. But I also feel that way about starting books and yeah. starting, you know, I'm not going to like sit through a whole movie and then be like, well, I could have been watching one of the other zillion things on Netflix, <laughs> you know. We, uh, my family used to have the, or we still have the AMC A-list thing where you can see like three movies a week for $5 a month or whatever it is, seven at this point, probably. Yeah. Um, and my parents used to go like multiple times a week before the pandemic started because it was like their date nights or their like wind downs and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And so adorable, by the way. And, and, yeah, real and cute. Um, so cute. And if they saw a bad one, they just called it like they they we always like a good B movie, you know, like an 80s B movie or like, yeah something like that they were they'll like grade it they'll be like that was just a b movie or that was just meh but this one was great or something like that and i'm like yeah what an interesting i feel like it's like an upside down bell curve it's like it has to be like really good or really bad for you to enjoy it and then there's like <laughs> this dip of like if it's only kind of bad i'm like huh i wish i hadn't seen that but if it's like you know i don't know like if it's so bad it's <laughs> tornado like tornado shark <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah like i'm like yeah, I'm really happy that I sat through that. <laughs> I've never sat through that one or um the cra other ones. What is the is tornado the tornado shark the one Sharknado? There it is. That's the name of it. Sharknado. I uh, yeah, <laughs> which is so much better than tornado shark. I'm glad I'm not in the business <laughs> of naming movies. <laughs> yeah, they named that, not me. No, that's really funny. Um, but yeah, so like the really the really wild like cult ones that are like, oh yeah, you have to see it because it's bad. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah the like sort of cult cult classics yeah. yeah it either has to be really good or really bad to be like that was a fun experience did you watch the movie about the movie the room I didn't no I've seen the room but I haven't watched the the movie that's like a it's like a mockumentary about it right yeah it was wonderful. Like, I remember seeing, yeah. I think I saw that before I saw The Room, which was a mistake. But, like, I still got the vibe. And my friend told me about The Room beforehand because she was, like, really down for it. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, <laughs> so funny. Like, really, really, like, if you liked The Room or thought it was, like, uh, funny because it was bad in that way. The sim same thing with the one about it, which I don't remember the name of. But, mm -hmm. Uh, really good really excellent um so do you have any shows or any works happening around you that you would like to promote today man I don't I mean a lot of what I've been doing in the pandemic has been like non-theater related I mean mostly because we haven't but like I started a blog and write on it often which is on my website that's just francescabettencourt.com um and I've like been painting a lot I've been like t like sort of taking part in other 
other things um, yeah. that are like not theater based. Um, yeah, I will probably be teaching a class around consent and collaborative and immersive spaces because I've been sort of teaching in this realm of like improv and what does consent look like when there's not choreography associated oh, with yeah. it. Um, I have no dates for that, so I have no way to promote it. But if you follow me on like social media or on my website, it'll be there at some point. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff like going on around DC, if you're like a DC area baby. Um, I don't know. There's not a ton. I also like, I'm, I'm fairly new to the city. And so, um, yeah, there's not a lot that I know so far. Um, I feel like you probably are more tapped into things in... It within Seattle yeah. that are going on right now since I'm no longer in that area. Um, yeah. Sorry, that was very unhelpful. No. <laughs> You're fine. I was like, I don't know, nothing really. I sometimes paint flowers. Um, <laughs> I've definitely been like sewing more and like doing weird crafts, like making paper and like anything that like strikes my fancy. I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to go do that. Like I see a a video of someone making paper while I'm like oh well um, I'll be doing that later today thank you <laughs> yeah yeah it's been Sporadic. a nice breath to be like what other creative things are fun to do yeah gar like I, I repotted all these plants today and I was like yeah I like there's you know there's opportunity when we sort of lose other things yeah definitely yeah, like shift focus and then we grow in so many other places. Like you lean into something and grow there and then you're like, oh no, I'm unbalanced. I have to grow that way too. Totally. I'm a little flower now if you're watching. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a really good metaphor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just becomes a performance art piece. Um. <laughs> right. That Joey Tribbiani performs. <laughs> yes. In a dark, non-black box theater. It's just like... Yeah. <laughs> Turtle so just like a street corner um well awesome do you have any self promo you'd like to throw out aside from your website i will link that below like your socials and stuff no i don't think so yeah, yeah just those i think as as things open up as there will be more things that will show up on those two places beautiful well i will link those in the description for anyone interested in following francesca on the social medias Mm -hmm. um that's perfect and so my last sneaky question the, ti the right. time has a come sneaky question time has come for the sneaky question um uh -huh. who would you like to see on this podcast <gasps> uh oh my gosh I wish I had I have like so many I also don't know who you had um yes <laughs> do you know who okay the first person I'm thinking of is do you know who Mario Aralo Molinero is I don't He's the artistic director of Jet City Improv. He's also an actor. He's wonderful. He's also just, he's he's an incredible advocate and activist for people in the arts. He's just, he's hilarious. He's bright. He's wonderful. He's in Seattle. Um, yeah, so he's definitely one. Um, uh, my friend Ann James is not in Seattle and you may or may not be able to, to snag her because she's very busy, but she is the um, artistic director and executive director of Intimacy Directors of Color, okay. Intimacy Coordinators of Color. Um, and she's just also very wonderful and has so many, she's been in the industry for a long time and just really is so insightful and also imagines such a beautiful, bright better future for our industry in the way that she moves through the world. Um, yeah, I, those are the two people that are popping into my brain. That's awesome. Point. That's awesome. Well, yeah. if you think of more, please like email them to me. You can send a list if you're like, I have too many friends. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I, I'm like immediately, oh, this person, this person. <laughs> yes, definitely send me a list. People do that. And it's very helpful for me, number one and number two. Very fun. Um, well, those sound amazing. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have anything else you want to throw out into the podcast? No, thanks for having me. This was so lovely. Oh my God, it was so nice to meet and chat with you. Um, thank you guys for listening, wherever you are listening from. If you wouldn't mind, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, follow, subscribe. I don't know. Do whatever you're supposed to do on the platform that you are on. And thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.